So this is the last of our lectures in reinforcement learning. Uh, and today we're going to continue talking about the AlphaGo family of game solvers. So if we talked about on Monday AlphaGo, right, which had these handcrafted features that were designed based on understanding of how to play Go, and then the, a network that was trained on human plays. So trained initially in human plays and then improved using reinforcement learning and self-play. AlphaGo Zero is what we're gonna start talking about today. And that's a different idea. We have no handcrafted features. We just basically feed in the Go board as it is. And there's also no training based on human games. Instead, we just have all self-play. So what that means is it starts out playing really crappy, right? The good news is since it's playing against itself, it's not that hard an opponent uh, uh, to beat. So you can think of it kind of as shaping. We've talked about in, in the past this idea of using shaping and reinforcement learning to adjust uh, the task that needs to be done. Uh, that was in fact what we did the first day of class with Mazda where we where Mazda was eventually going to be rewarded by doing jumping jacks. And we gave him some uh, reward for earlier, easier things. So here, what we're saying was giving some reward for being a really crappy player. And then you'll have a slightly better player. Your opponent will be slightly better because your opponent is yourself. And so we just have this bootstrapping mechanism in another form, in a different form from any bootstrapping we've seen before. Another change is we have a single neural network rather than two neural networks. So we used to have two neural networks. Uh, so in AlphaGo, there were two networks, one for the policy and a separate one for the value function. And now we just put these together. So we get rid of the handcrafted features. We have no human games. We have one network and we also have a simplified Monte Carlo tree search. So we're not going to do any rollouts at all, which is why we also no longer have that rollout policy. Uh, remember that was just this linear uh, uh, function based on uh, a bunch of local, easily computable features. So instead, uh, what do we have? Well, first off, let's, let's look at the game state. So remember the game state before it, all these handcrafted features. Now we're trying to be as sort of straightforward as possible for what a game state is. So we've got this 19 by 19, okay, that's for the game board, uh, by 17 stack. Okay, so it's a, uh, I would call it, a, let's see, a sparse encoding of, of the game. So what we have is um, on the top are the black stones. So these are all the blacks. And they're all because we're looking at the um, current state plus the previous seven states. So this was actually something we were also providing in the AlphaGo case as well. Um, but we need to do that in order to have some dynamics of the, uh, of the game having to do, I believe, with repetitions. And then the same thing for the whites, okay? Could we have represented a game state by having a single 19 by 19, a game state at a particular time period with a single 19 by 19 and having, let's say, different numbers at those various 19 by 19s, specifying whether it's a empty or white or black? Yes. And in fact, the paper says it was pretty robust to different reasonable representations of the, of the game state. And then at the bottom, we have what seems crazy. We need to say whose turn it is to play. So it's either black's turn or white, okay? But uh, the fact is the kind of a neural network they're using wants to have a, uh, a multi-dimensional matrix, okay? So in this case, three-dimensional. And so we want to have the dimensions of this last one still be 19 by 19. So we just replicate throughout. We just put ones everywhere saying it's Black's turn, and we'll put zeros everywhere to say it's White's turn. Okay, because that's a better representation for us than sort of 19 by 19 by 16 plus an oddball. Okay, it's easier to feed in this 
uh, single tensor. A single tensor is a, a multidimensional array. Questions so far? Okay, so that's our input. Uh, you'll agree, sort of, there's no handcrafted features here. This is pretty much just like you'd see on a board, as long as you kept back uh, a, a game Go board and you kept the last uh, eight uh, plays. The neural network then, we have this single neural network. It feeds in the game state. So this is the 19 by 19 by 17 tensor. Okay, and a tensor is just uh, a name for a uh, array with multiple dimensions in it. So I by J by K by L by M, uh, that is a, is a tensor. So a matrix is just a, a special case two dimensional tensor. So what we're doing then is we have just two outputs. Output one and output two. Okay, and we could do this with neural networks. Uh, how doesn't particularly matter if you took the neural network class, you know about having multiple heads. Uh, and this takes advantage of this multitask learning. So before in AlphaGo, we had two separate networks, one learning the value, one learning the policy, but theoretically there's a lot to be shared there, right? There's a lot to let's say know that in this part of the board, um, black has let's say a lot of area captured, and that might both affect the value that you're assigning to that game state, as well as the policy that you're gonna use. So here, we share that information. By sharing the information, we have fewer parameters to train, and we're less likely to, uh, to do uh, overtraining. The value, uh, the output of this, can be some you know, real number. Let's say, make it between uh, negative one to positive one, or it could be a number between zero and one, specifying the probability of the current player winning. Either either one is fine, and then the and I don't remember which one it is. And then the policy. Um, let's see, Maz, did you remember we talked about this before? So what might the policy look like? How would that be represented? Um, so. The policy is just a mapping of states to actions and actions here, I guess, would be just a coordinate of where to go. So would that be it? That would be right. But remember the policy, we're we, we represent a policy as a probability distribution over actions. Mm. I see. So a function that maps, uh, you know, takes pairs of coordinates or takes coordinates and gives a probability, something like that. That's right. Takes coordinates and gives a probability. And the simplest way to do that is just to have sort of a 19 by 19 uh, plus one probabilities, right? That's right, the pass, got you. Right, where the one is the pass. Yep, so, and we learned uh, two days ago that two passes in a row means uh, uh, a, a draw or something, or the game is over. So, uh, not that that's gonna come up. Okay, so that is our neural neck. So it's, again, a simplification, right? We've simplified from having previously two neural networks, separate neural networks, separately trained to a single neural network of two outputs. Also another simplification again is the lack of the handcrafted features and just basically uh, putting in the state pretty much uh, uh, unadorned. Uh, the value we just talked about this, the particulars of the neural network don't really matter too much. And here are 19 by 19 plus one probabilities. And uh, we're gonna still do self-play, right? So that's still gonna be happening. We start with a with a, a state. So, you know, let's say a start state with an empty board. And then we go ahead and do Monte Carlo tree search. And that gives us a probability distribution. Okay, it's not gonna actually tell us exactly what to play. What we're gonna use is we have the root node, right? So we have the root, actually here's the root. And we have all the children of, of here. And we're gonna just take the probabilities of all these. So we're gonna look at the count as a, a proxy uh, for you know, a, a probability. Uh, so we can just take the count over the sum of the counts. 
Um, we'll see, we're gonna do maybe a little bit more than that later, but that's basically it. So that gives us actually a distribution rather than just a single action to take. Then we'll go ahead and uh, sample from here. Now, whether we're sampling or taking the maximum, uh, I, I believe we actually take the maximum, but let's, let's ignore that for a second. So we take an action. Now we've got a new state. We do the same Monte Carlo tree search. We then get a probability distribution and so on and so on. So what we're ending up with are a bunch of states, a bunch of probability distributions and a bunch of actions. When we're done, the game is over and we get some real life information as to who won and who lost. And so then for our neural net training, basically what we're going to do is um, we have our states that are coming in to our neural network and they are outputting probabilities and outputting values. Okay? And we can, we can see how good that is, or rather we can come up with a target for let's say the probability with the Monte Carlo probability, right? Because if I go back a second, if we look, pi sub one is going to be greater than or equal to, let's say, p sub one, where p sub one is the output of the neural net. I guess I should, could, so this is greater than or equal to p sub one. And so therefore, we can go ahead and train and say, we would like S1 to output something closer to pi sub one. It's currently outputting P1. So this is current and this is desired or target. Does that training make sense? All right, and then the other thing we've got to train is our Vs. So our Vs, how do we come up with that? Well, basically we're gonna take our Z which is did we win or did we lose? And kind of back that up and say that is what each of these Vs should be closer to, right? They should be closer to Z than whatever they are now. So we had our particular uh, estimate of our value and now we have a true value for this state, at least based on this particular game that we played. Okay, so we have our game. Let's say the game went 50 moves long. Uh, Julius, how many training examples are we, are we gonna have from that 50 move game? So 50 moves, so each move we get a training, right? So I would yep. say 50. Yeah, so each move we'll get a training. Basically, we'll get a state let's say an S sub i, and then we'll have a pi sub i and a z, which will be our targets, right? The z is gonna be the same across all of the steps or the moves of the game, right? And so what we'll do is just take, so we will put into our um, uh, replay buffer, 50 of these different training examples. We have to wait till the game's over, right? We have to wait till the game is over. We have the pi sub i's, but we don't have to defeat the z's. So we have to wait until game is over for the z's. So we only update z at the end of the 50. We, don't, we only know what z is at the end, right? That is, did we actually win or did we actually lose? So we didn't go back to update those. Uh, you can think of it as go back to update those. Think of it as maybe you just hold on to them. Um, you know, while you're playing the game, you hold on to them. And then once you finish the game, you go back, repopulate them, and then throw them in the, in the replay buffer. Okay. And then the replay buffer is going to be responsible. For, we, a separate process will be responsible for pulling out batches from the replay buffer and updating the neural network. I see. So we'll have two simultaneous things happen. One will be playing games 
right? So where we'll go through and play games and generate training examples, and those will get thrown in the replay buffer. And then a separate process will be going through and pulling things from the replay buffer and updating the neural net. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other thing we want to look at is, whoops, we haven't really talked about the Monte Carlo tree search. So that's different now too, right? Because I said that we aren't going to be doing rollouts. For our training, right, what we're trying to do is we're trying to update theta, right? Theta is our parameters of our neural network. And we basically want to say, we've got a particular input state S sub i, and we've got a particular output for that S sub i, right? So F sub theta of S sub i gives you a um, P sub i and a V sub i. And we want to make those P sub i's and V sub i's closer to pi sub i and z. Okay. Pi sub i, because we have something better, because it's a Monte Carlo tree search improved policy. So we now have a better policy than we did have for this particular state. And also, we have a better value than we used to, be, used to in the sense that we have an actual result. Okay. Now, it's certainly true that as we play more, maybe sometimes we'll end up with this same state of the game and sometimes we'll lose from this position where previously we had won. Well, that's fine because we would assume over time we're going to actually, um, the network is going to learn the true sort of mean average. Okay. So we're taking a bunch of samples and then can come up with a, a, a true estimate. And the Monte Carlo tree search, uh, we have the same edges we used to have. There's no change there. So we have, again, a count. How many, how many times has this state action pair been seen? A, a total W, which is how much Q value have we gotten? Q, which just represents the uh, average W value. And then our prior probability, right? So this comes from neural net. Uh, we have this exploration that we do, and we do the exploration using the upper confidence bounds, right? So there, if we have a low um, count, that increases the chances of choosing this action. Nothing, nothing different here, right? This is just what we've seen in standard Monte Carlo tree search. We saw it again in AlphaGo, Alpha Go, and now we're seeing it in AlphaGo Zero. Okay, the other thing that's done, which I think is interesting, is the add some Dirichlet noise to the top level. So Dirichlet is a, is a probability distribution that kind of looks like uh, it's kind of mostly low with some peaks, okay? The number of peaks, uh, the tendency of the number of peaks sort of depends on the parameter used for the Dirichlet noise. But how this is being used is to update the top level P of S. Okay. So what that tends to do is randomly increase a few actions at the top level. Okay. And that's going to be used, it's the same, whoops, it's the same for all the simulation runs. Right, so if we're going to do a thousand runs of, of, of Monte Carlo tree search, then we're going to go ahead and uh, set this um, P to be P plus this Dirichlet noise and then just leave it alone. And so what that is going to tend to do is from the top level root, we will favor a few actions at random. Okay. So what this is going to do is cause us to do some look ahead for those random actions more than we do other actions. Okay, so there might be a very good action that we will choose a lot, but uh, then below that, as we start exploring, we're more likely to be choosing these, these, these uh, few actions. 
and then we'll go and build up a subtree for those few actions. So we'll have, uh, let's say, two of these deer slay ones, we'll call them Ds. And so these will explore more than others. And so that'll give us uh, some look ahead possibility, right? Because we're gonna be looking ahead. If, if we change the deer slay noise every time, we would be picking different actions at every different simulation run. But here uh, we are going to be for every one of our simulation runs, still be favoring these same actions. So we'll tend to do some exploration down here. And it may be that some exploration down here may find that if we look two or three moves ahead, all of a sudden looks, something looks good. Um, so rather than our standard exploration, which kind of just looks one move ahead, and then in the future, we're maybe not likely to choose that again, here we do more. So uh, Maz, let me look at this question on the chat. So the question is, how are we gonna get Q if we don't have rollouts? It's a great question, we're not there yet. So it's, a, it's an open question for the moment. Is our final policy determined just by the sequence of MCTSs during the game? Our final policy, well, so let's think about P sub I. P sub I is really not our overall total policy. P sub i, well, let's think about that slightly different. So let me go back to this picture, right? As we look at P sub, let's say one, this is really P sub one of S1, okay? Or actually another way to think of this is it's P sub one equals P of S1. So it's just the probability distribution for that explicit state. And then P sub K is just the, pop, the probability distribution for, again, a given state uh, S sub K. So the overall policy is kind of what this neural network does across all states. And as we update and do a episode of training the neural network, we are changing our network to more closely approximate the pies that we trained with. And we don't exactly know what it's gonna to do to the P's for other states. That's why we, we, we move it slowly. Okay, so we don't move in just one step. Uh, does that answer that question, Mazda? So I guess the, the short answer is no. Pi sub T uh, isn't really that, yeah, okay. Um, so Nick, we're still gonna get back to your question of what do we do if we don't have rollouts? Uh, we don't have a rollout policy. The top level is as we have a state in the real game and we're supposed to choose an action in the real game, right? So that's one of these states that's coming in from the game, that's the top level. And then below that, we're building out our tree using our tree policy where our tree policy is uh, F. So it's the uh, using our neural network to figure out the probabilities. So again, we don't have a rollout policy because we're not going to use rollouts. Basically, we're going to expand our tree, but once we get to a leaf, we're not going to do rollouts. So we're going to come up with another way to do this. And that way is Uh, I'm sorry, so this is the selection. Nothing's different about this from AlphaGo Zero. We just have this um, um, uh, Q, which is the current Q ex exponentiation we have. So this is the exploitation plus our exploration bonus, which is related to our P, which is our prior information coming from our uh, neural network and then the number of times we've tried it. Okay, nothing different there. Here's what's different. When we get to the bottom, so we get, let's say we look at, so this is the current state we're in and we're trying to look for an action. We look ahead here, okay, we look ahead here in the sense we're building our tree and then we expand this tree 
and now we're here. And normally what we would do is we would say the way we are gonna figure out what it's worth to be in this state is we're gonna do a rollout till the game ends. And now we say we don't do that. Instead, uh, Dave, how, what can we use to estimate that value? Do we have any way to estimate values of a state? I can't hear you, Dave. The neural net, exactly. In fact, you'll remember in AlphaGo, in AlphaGo, it's hard to get these names right. So in AlphaGo, we took half and half, right? We took half rollout plus half of the value function. And now in AlphaGo zero, uh, we take zero of the rollout. I'm just making that up, plus one of the value function. So we're left with just the value function. So we have a value approximator that takes a state and returns you what the value is. That's what we use. So this is another form of bootstrapping. Right, we're bootstrapping our value function to come up with our high level value and policy. Does that answer your question, Jake, right, about not having rollouts? Basically, we just get rid of that. So again, we're just simplifying, right? We're saying, you know, it's, it was a little complicated to go ahead and have rollouts and also have the value function. Let's just go and see how far we can get with uh, uh, just using the value function. And it turns out surprisingly well. Uh, it doesn't work better. It works as well as rollouts, uh, really. Uh, and it's simpler. And so that's, there's something to be said for that. Uh, really, so I guess the key thing about both AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero is uh, we are, in both cases, we're doing this self-play and it appears to be we can continue to improve doing more and more and more play. Varun has a question, where does this get any basis in reality? That's a good point. We need to be grounded in reality at some point. How do we get grounded in the reality? We get grounded in reality because of the fact when we are training our neural network, we are training our neural network with ground truth. That is, we're training our neural network with, for every state that happened in the game, did we win or lose, okay? And as we are training this neural network, our hope, and, 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 and actually our hope is justified, is that the neural network will generalize, right? So our, our neural network, by being trained on a bunch of particular game states and results, will generalize to unknown game states and results. So therefore, when we use the neural network to be evaluating game states for which we're not necessarily going to be ever training the neural network, right? Because these are not game, these are only game states that happen in our um, planning, right? In our monocolor tree research simulation that don't actually happen in the real game. We don't ever, we don't know the real value for this. But our neural network training should train our value function enough. And you can see why when they did AlphaGo, they thought, well, you know, we probably want to go ahead and have us based in reality. We don't want to do so much bootstrapping. It would make sense to go ahead and uh, have some rollouts so we get some rational estimates of what this value is, as opposed to using the value function that in turn we're trying to train. Yeah, so pi and pi, pi and p. Pi equals the Monte Carlo tree search improved p, right? So p of, let's just say actually of pi. So pi equals 
the neural network. So it's really f of the state i. So p is the neural network as it stands right now. Monte Carlo tree search is uh, for that given state, what is our improved policy? That is our improved probabilities for actions given the Monte Carlo tree search improvement. Does it explain that? To... Okay. And Varun says the neural network is used to play a game by using its value estimates and then train itself in the actual state in the game encounter and repeats the process. Uh, so, yes, the neural network is playing a game. But so when you're playing a game with a neural network, how's the neural network actually used? It's used because we come up with, let me change colors here, let's say, we come up with the P's for every state action uh, in the tree, right? Every edge in the tree. And then we use the V to evaluate leaf states. So V evaluates leaf states. these new expanded nodes, and P um, sets prior probability uh, for state action pairs. And so, yes, we, so the P and the V are used within the Monte Carlo tree search. And then what we come out of the Monte Carlo tree search, if you think of this, is really a pi, right, some i, so it's an improved policy. And really, we also get, if we wanted it, and we'll later on we'll use this, we do get an improved value as well, right? If we look at the roots q, that's really our best estimate of what the root is worth. Okay, now later on, we're going to get some reality to find out what it's really worth, but this gives us an estimate that we are not using right now uh, for AlphaGo zero. And then when we back up, we do our same normal old backup. And when we do, we do our normal old play. Let's look at what pi is. So pi, we're gonna really say, given we're in a given state, what is our probability for a particular action? It's gonna be n over the sum of the Ends. So if we look at the ends for all of our children from the root, um, the sum is the denominator and the numerator is the n. And we have this temperature constant that affects how much, I guess what I would, how I would describe it is it affects how much the, it becomes a winner take all. Okay, so lower temperature, causes pi to become winner take all. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. So let's say we have a distribution which looks like uh, that, okay? The winner is this guy by hair, right? He's slightly higher than the, than, than the other ones. If we go ahead and take each of these probabilities and raise them to a power of uh, one half, okay, so take the square root of them, then that's gonna tend to decrease the low ones and increase the high ones. So the, I'm not sure I'm gonna do a good job of this, but it's gonna accentuate the uh, higher probabilities. So, I really can only look at these three. So if I look at these three, they're pretty darn close before. And now if I take to the one half power, then they're more accentuated, okay? If I take to the one quarter power, they will be even more accentuated. And if I take conceptually them to the infinity power, then basically one of them is gonna be one, whatever's highest, and all the rest will be zero. Okay. Uh, 
Um, so what that means then is that we are, how to describe this? Um, well, so at the beginning, we're not wedded. to our winner, right? We will sample from the probability distribution. And so if something is slightly more likely than something else, it'll be slightly more likely to choose that action. As time goes on, we reduce the temperature more and more and more, such that we're just choosing the maximum. Okay, so this is again, a form of exploration. Uh, Varun says, so this is, is this technically Monte Carlo tree search? Um, uh, I suppose you could argue See how we could argue. You can argue that it's not Monte Carlo because of the fact that we lose the, Monte Car the rollout at the end, which is typically Monte Carlo, right? Because Monte Carlo says we take the entire episode. In some way, you could think of this as kind of a, and I'm just making this terminology up, a TDTS, right? A temporal difference um, uh, tree search because we are doing this bootstrapping based on the uh, um, leaf node but everyone calls it Monte Carlo tree search. Okay. And in, I mean, in some ways it, the Monte Carlo, if we just look at Monte Carlo's, this idea of doing randomization and we are doing these multiple trials and that is a Monte Carlo type thing to do, you know, trying 800 times, you know, rolling the dice, see what happens. Well, let me not say rolling the dice, uh, uh, taking these different simulations. All right, so in this AlphaGo zero, what are we using that's specific about Go? We know the input format, right? We know how many actions there are uh, in the network. We know in our Monte Carlo tree search, we know what actions lead to what states. That's a really key part of what we use, right? We know whether a state is terminal or not in our Monte Carlo tree search, uh, because if it is, we don't try and expand it. We know how to score a terminal state as well. Uh, and Actually, I didn't mention this, but Mon the Monte Carlo tree search actually does reflection or rotation, right? Since Go boards and the, the game of Go is independent on rotation and independent on horizontal or vertical reflection, uh, it actually arbitrarily, when you take a child and look at the state that you get from that child, arbitrarily rotates it and reflects it. So that is also some Go knowledge, because that's not true, for instance, uh, in chess. And why does this matter? Because the next thing we're gonna look at is what happens if we remove the go, okay? So we just say, let's use the same algorithm, but try and apply it to things other than go. Okay, still board games. So what do we do? Well, let's simplify some more, right? Uh, I believe I mentioned in passing that in the alpha go zero, it actually had this concept of the best current neural network, right? And you, the uh, trained neural network can only become the new one if it beat the old one by a certain amount. And here we just says, let's just simplify, just keep training the latest. Um, and then the same other ideas, we use the same network. So the network itself is the same, the input format and the output format have to be different, right? Because what you input for Go is different for what you input for chess. All that there is is a single hyperparameter that, that changes, nothing else. So if we look at the value head, the value is gonna actually be identical based on the game. I'd be sorry. So this is independent of the game. Okay, and this is a game, by the way, that has either a winner or a loser or a draw, right? So that's important, true for chess, True for Shogi, which is the Japanese chess. Two for Go. Two for Connect Four. Uh, not true for, let's say, uh, I don't know, a betting poker, where you're betting some money and it, the amount that you win matters. Or even backgammon, uh, possibly, where there's this doubling cube that affects how much the game is worth. Okay, so the game, the value head is the same. The um, policy head 
we're going to get to in a moment. So domain knowledge. The Monte Carlo tree search still is going to know which action leads to which state, still knows whether a state is terminal, still knows how to score a terminal state. And of course, all those are going to be dependent on the game that you're playing. So these will be different rules for different games. Uh, we do need to know the typical number of legal moves. That's going to scale this Dirichlet noise. Okay, because basically what happens when you set a Dirichlet parameter, if you had uh, 4,000 legal moves, then as opposed to, I don't know, 100 legal moves, then you're going to get many more um, 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 high selected actions, many more of those high points. And you want to have about the same number. You want to have several of those. And so that's... Uh, the number of actions is used to scale that parameter. So what's a game state for chess? It is more complicated than for, um, for Go. Um, I mean, theoretically, and you could incorporate it this way, you could just have an eight by eight, right? And you could have a given value here, and it could be, let's say, one, for a black pawn and, I don't know, two for a black rook and three for a black bishop and then so on. And then negatives for white. That actually would all work, okay? But they choose to break it down into separate planes. So they have a plane for the pawns a plane for the rooks, a plane for the bishops, for the knights, for the queens, for the king. White queens, because you might have promoted and gotten more than one queen. And then you have some uh, extra planes uh, as well. Uh, so whose move, um, how many moves have there been? Because if you have more than a certain number of moves, it's a draw, it's my understanding. Some other things like has white um, um, castled yet, because you only get to castle once. Has black castled yet? Uh, have they moved their pieces? So, so you end up with an eight by eight by 119, which is fairly large, but in any case, um, eight by 119. And Shogi, you have even more stuff you have to keep track of, so it's nine by nine by 362. The neural network, this part, is the same. The inputs are different, okay? The input gets matched with an output. So if you have the Go input, you have a Go policy output. If you have a chess input, you're gonna have a chess policy output. And if you have a Shogi input, you're gonna have a Shogi output, right? So. It is, it is not one network that is trained to play all three games. It is one network architecture and set of hyperparameters. But there are three different instantiations of the network. One for Go, one for chess, one for Shogi. The value, uh, the format of the value is shared among all of those, right? What gets represented, which is a single output between negative one and one. Questions so far? Okay, so the policy head is fairly straightforward. For chess, it's eight by eight by 73 probabilities. Now, what the heck is going on there? Uh, the reason is we have where we're moving from. Okay, so the from is an eight by eight. And then we have got, um, we don't just directly represent where we're moving to, we actually, represent the uh, possible different uh, directions and how far we go. So basically you could go north by one or two or three or four or five or six or seven moves, south, east, west, southeast, northwest, you know, the, the four different diagonals is fine. You've also got the possible night moves. Um, 
And then if you take a pawn and promote it, that is take it to the eighth level, you can turn that into a queen or a bishop or a rook or a pawn. I, I guess you can turn it into a pawn. I'm not sure about that. Um, or one of those other pieces. So you need to differentiate that, differentiate that as well. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm not even going to go through the rest of that. Okay. So that's all that we use as a way to represent uh, what the possible actions are. And so that's uh, just these eight by eight by 73 probabilities that sum to one. Okay. So probability distribution. Uh, basically, works great, you know, works great, less filling in the sense, right? This is similar. It just, it just, uh, they made one or two slight other tweaks from AlphaGo Zero, but basically it's just the same as, as Alpha Zero, as AlphaGo Zero. And this basically says, nice, this generalizes the approach. So this is, uh, and the neural network itself. So we were not somehow tuning that neural network specifically for Go, tuning the number of levels uh, and the hyperparameters and so on just for Go. It's a general purpose architecture that is working for these spatial board games. There's no transfer learning on the neural network. It's all each trained from scratch independently. So we have a Go neural network. We train it to self-play on Go. We have a chess neural network. We train it to self-play on chess and so on. Okay. It is certainly the case that um, civilians somehow think that we have one AI that knows how to play all these different games. And that's not really the case. We have trained separate, separate neural networks, but what's key about it is the neural networks are so, so similar and trained all in the same way. And all we really had to change was the, uh, the games themselves, which forces us to change the inputs and the outputs. Okay. All right, so where can we go next? Uh, yeah, we have simple representation. We improve, right, the Monte Carlo tree search improves P to pi. This is true for AlphaGo and AlphaGo zero and Alpha zero. And when we're training a neural network, right, our X, our input is our game state and our output uh, is, so our actual output is a policy and a value. Our target is our pi, which is an improved policy, and our ground truth value. That is, when we played this game, what was the result? And we're not gonna have time to revisit the architecture. Um, I would just look at look it up. Uh, there's a couple reasons. If you haven't taken neural networks, it was too confusing to see. And the other is now we got to look at the more important thing, which is how the heck do we get to play it if we don't know the rules of the game? Okay, and this is recent 2019 paper. So mu zero doesn't know the rules of the game. Okay, during the Monte Carlo tree search. Um, so here's what it does know. If you have a state and it's time to play, it will tell you what moves are legal, okay? So if you have a policy for a given state, you can mask out all the, the um, illegal moves, which kind of makes sense. It's as if, you know, you're sitting there in front of a chessboard, you've never played chess, and you say, I'm gonna move, you know, there are, uh, whatever the number we had, eight by eight by whatever it was, uh, 30 different act, possible actions, I'm gonna pick this one. And, and, and someone say, no, that's not valid. Okay, this one, nope, not valid. This one, nope, not valid. So, so you will be told you can't do that move. 
okay? But only in the actual game. You can't say, hey, hypothetically, if the board looked like this, could I make this action? Would that be legal? No, can't do that. Okay, that's one thing. You're also told if the game is over. So you're told, hey, this is the last action, the game is over, and you're also told the result of that. Was the game a win, a lose, or a draw, right? For, uh, let's say, black. Okay. So during the Monte Carlo tree search, you don't get any of that information. You don't get to know in this, in, in this state what would happen if I played this action, okay? What reward would I get? Would I end up in a terminal state? Um, if it was a terminal state, who won and who lost? None of that. You have to learn some model, some representation of the world. So this is exactly looking at Dr. Talbot's idea of, of, from, from last week of, boy, that's hard, okay? And it is, and especially if you get something wrong, you can go off course. And so we'll see how this works. Uh, and we also, hey, while we're at it, let's go ahead and not just use board games where we have a win, lose, or draw at the end. Let's go ahead and use games um, where first off, clearly we don't know dynamics of the Atari games. We do know the dynamics of, of chess and Go and so on. And so it's not as interesting to say, hey, we've trained it and it doesn't know the rules. For Atari, it's a lot clearer to say, we don't know the rules. You know, we don't know in a particular state of action what's gonna happen, we, uh, what's gonna happen next, what the reward is gonna be. The other thing is we have the points earned at each step. So it's not that we have points at the very end, we have points learned along the way, and we're gonna actually use discounting as well. So we're gonna look at, uh, at getting, increasing the total number of awards. And also, it's not two player, that's interesting also. It's a single player game. So how does this work? Well, we don't know this, right? So our hands are tied behind our back. How will we do this? We're gonna have to try and learn something, okay? We could try and learn given a board, let's say, right, given an, a state and an action, we could predict what would we want to do? New state and the reward. That'd be an, uh, enough, I think, right? Even if we didn't know whether a state was terminal, we could go ahead and fake that by having an absorbing state, right? A state, of, in fact, we looked at this in the past when we were looking at how to, um, how to uh, represent episodic tasks uh, in a continuing fashion. And the idea was just, if we have a terminal state, just go ahead and say any action leads you back here with a zero reward. Okay, does that concept make sense? So we don't actually have to know whether they're terminal. All we have to, all, all that we have to do is somehow have our prediction be such that if we were in a terminal state, we stay in that safe terminal state and we get a, a reward of zero. Okay. The problem is this is hard given a board state and an action, predict a new board state. So we are going to make it a little easier, okay? We're gonna still have a network that'll generate what we call the dynamics. So the dynamics is, we really wanna know a set of, or sorry, a sequence of rewards. We wanna match the sequence of rewards that we'd get in real life. We're not gonna use the real states, right? O sub K, we're gonna call observation K. So this is our real state. We're gonna instead use hidden states. We, all, we are gonna call them S's, okay? Cause that's what we're gonna use from now on. And so the idea is we take the real 
let's say this is our go state, right, with little. And we are going to transform it into a hidden state. The idea is we're going to have a neural network that will, so this is our H neural network, that's going to go into this hidden state. What's going to be in that hidden state? Whatever is going to be most useful for our set of neural networks to learn and predict. So we're not going to force what's going to be in there. We're going to let it be learned. So we're going to have a representation function. Our representation function is h sub theta, and it's going to take our observations, that is our real game state, to our hidden state. From everywhere else on, we're going to use that hidden state. We're going to have a prediction function, just like we used to before, f sub theta, except instead of taking a real state, it's going to take a hidden state. And it's going to come with the same old p sub k and v sub k, right? Where p sub k is what's the probability distribution for s sub k, and v sub k is what is the value of s sub k. And then our dynamics model is going to take an old state, hidden state, and an action. And this will be our reward, right? Our immediate reward and our new state. Again, hidden state. If we know the rewards we're getting, and we know a sequence of states, a sequence of hidden states, and if working with those hidden states gives us that same rewards and uh, correct policies and values, then it doesn't matter whether there's this one-to-one -one correspondence between real states and hidden states. It's just whatever turns out to be useful. And currently we have no uh, intuition or no knowledge of what actually is learned. Does, um, so we're gonna sort of use this bit by bit and learn how to train this. But can you see how this would give us enough information? Or actually, let's look at the use of this. So let's look at how we can use this in Monte Carlo tree search. So in alpha zero, we had the actual state of the board. Of the board or the screen or whatever, right? We have the actual state and it's, we're showing a picture of the, what is that, a chessboard right now, right? Keep in mind, it's actually all of the information, including the last seven moves and so on. Okay, and in alpha zero, we take an action, we use the environment to figure out, right? We knew we are, our understanding of the rules to come up with a reward and a new state. Now that reward uh, for the games, the board games we're talking about is basically zero all the time until we get to a terminal state and it's one. But conceptually, that's what we're doing. We are coming up with every immediate reward. It just happens to always be zero until we get to the end of the game. In mu zero, here's the difference. We're gonna take the board state again. We're gonna call it O. We're going to transform it, slash encode it in some very tricky way. It's gonna be so tricky because we're not gonna, we're not gonna design it. We're gonna go ahead and let uh, gradient descent come up with a really, really good representation here, really good encoding. And that is gonna be our S sub zero, okay? So this is hidden, unable to be interpreted, at least currently. We just don't know how to interpret what's in there. So if you give me one of those states, it's just not very useful, okay? But it is useful to F. So F can take one of those states and come up with a policy and value, which is important because we need to come up with a policy and value uh, 
uh, and really, really we've got A coming in here too, right? So A goes, goes into the uh, uh, equation for coming up with the policy. I'm sorry. Totally ignore what I just said. So, all right. We then, when we take an action, we don't have our environment. We don't understand the rules of the game. Instead, we're gonna feed through G, which gives us the dynamics of the environment, right? It gives us our learned dynamics of the environment. What does it give us? It gives us a reward, right? This is our predicted reward by G. And we have our predicted by G state. And now we can take that state, feed it through F to get a new policy in V right down here. So how is our monocolor tree search gonna change? The only way it's really gonna change is when we get an initial observation, we're gonna feed it through H to get a state, and then we're gonna use hidden states from then on. A second is, instead of feeding the environment, we're gonna always feed to G, okay? G will give us our policy, that we can use to pre-populate P for every edge. And the other difference is we're not gonna ever check for terminal states. We're gonna just always keep expanding the tree, hoping that G will correctly, if it ever figures out what a terminal state is, be just taking us back to the same state with zero reward. Oh, and Varun, what I meant by less filling was just simpler um, uh, way back when. Um, and I don't know, really, it's not particularly less filling. Um, alpha go zero was much simpler than alpha zero. Sorry, alpha go zero was simpler than alpha go. Alpha zero was really just generalizing alpha go zero. So maybe it wasn't less filling. How do the parameters get updated? We will talk about that. That's the key. So the key is how do you update those parameters? How do we do our neural network training? Um, and uh, I don't know that I actually need to show you this. I'm going to skip that right now. So our Monte Carlo tree search, we have as our inputs, we have, we have our current observation. That is the state for which we need to choose a move. We have coming in, think of it as F theta, G theta, and H theta. Really what we have is just our current three neural networks. Okay. Uh, we use a single theta here because in some sense they're all really related, right? It's, it's, if we tweak one, we'd have to tweak the others too. So we think of it as just one set of parameters. And what we output is an improved policy, right? Is this uh, any different, Garrett, from what we did in alpha zero? Um, it, it's just taking the policy of the other thing and using this tree search to improve it. So I don't think yeah, so. Same, same output, right? We say we still same have this improved policy. And we also have, I mentioned that conceptually what we get from the monocular tree search is also an improved uh, uh, evaluation of the state of the root. I'm going to call it new sub i. Um, here we're going to actually use it. Right, so this is the value, what I'm going to call the MCTS value of the root node. Right, this is the root of our MCTS, which is our actual game state that we have to play. Okay. So we have an improvement not only of our policy, but also of our value. Okay, because we do think V new sub i should be better than v sub i, right? So pi sub i should be better than or equal to p sub i and v sub i, sorry, new sub i should be better than or equal to v sub i. I should have thought about using, unfortunately new is what's used in the paper and I have never learned to write a new well. So I'll have to work on that. So here's what we do. We're gonna train f, g and h. 
to predict P and V well, and to predict the reward well, okay? And also kind of to make sure that G is predicting a new good useful hidden state, and that H is predicting the initial hidden state well. So all three of them tightly are going to uh, have to work together to do all this prediction. But the predictions are that we need our V, P, reward, and sort of as a side effect, it better be predicting new states along the way or none of this will work. Okay. Dr. Talbot, talked about the fact that it's easy when you have a model that is not entirely accurate for it to be mostly accurate for one step but then to get off for two steps and really diverge for three and four and five steps right so you get way off so what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that our loss function tests not only how well we do taking one step but also two steps and three steps and four steps and five steps using these simulated values right using these neural network values so we're gonna have to have some way of measuring or having a correct target for going five steps down the road. I'll show you what's going on here, okay? So we're gonna take our game, all our games, and we're gonna feed them into a experience, a replay buffer, okay? Here's what we might pull out from one of these. So this is game five and observation 42, right? So this is the 40, 40 second move. Yeah, it's the 40 second game state, which I guess is the 41st move, but let's just ignore that, right? It's 40, actually that's correct. Yeah. So it's a 40 second game state. I call it an observation because it's actually what we're seeing. And so we have O sub 42, that's our state. Uh, we have the reward, which is actually the reward we got from the previous move, right? So basically, when we were at state 41, we took action 41, and we got out of that state 42 and reward 42. Okay, so remember, we always have sort of our state, state I, action I yields, uh, reward I plus one, state I plus one, action I plus one. Okay, so we don't really care about this reward. We got it for something that happened in the, in the past. We're going to keep track of the state. We're going to keep track of the action. We're going to keep track of the improved policy. So, right, and we're going to keep track of the improved value. So, given state 42, Monte Carlo tree search gives us those three values. Is that clear? Because that's what Monte Carlo tree search does. It basically gives us a probability distribution, a policy distribution, a value, and we choose an action based on that policy distribution. So those are the things we want to save along the state reward. And then we have our, I don't show the next states here, because we're not gonna be using those explicitly, right? They are there, we're just not really using them. So we have 043, we have 044, we have 045, and we have 046, but I'm just ignoring those because we're not gonna use them. We are gonna be using these rewards for the next time steps. We're gonna be using all the actions we took. We're gonna be using the policies, and we're gonna be using the news here. Any questions on what we're saving? Okay, so these are gonna be doing this unroll. We just are basically gonna try and, we're gonna use these five steps of our actual game in order to train our three networks. Let's look at how. Okay, we're gonna do some predictions several steps ahead. So, we're gonna first take S sub 42 is H of O sub 42. 
And the zero here means zero steps ahead. Okay. So this is our, our hidden state that we got, we get from H looking at O sub 42. We can now look at what is the value and the policy that our neural network F would predict for that. Okay. This is not what we got out of our monocolor tree search. This is just what would F directly come up with for V and for P. And uh, Nick, what might we compare for a loss function to see how good we're doing? Uh, just the Euclidean distance between the two? Between the value and the policy? No, between the value you predicted in the Monte Carlo tree search value. Okay, we could do the value in the Monte Carlo tree search value. Um, let's do a simpler thing. Let's look at this policy and this policy. We can compare those, right? Okay. Okay, the values are going to be a little more complicated. We will, we will get to those in a, in a moment. Those are a little, a little more complicated. Sure. Okay. And then we can also get our predicted reward by using our dynamics. So we can take it our dynamics and say, um, if we started in S42 um, basically in the hidden state co corresponding to S42, what would happen if we took one set of dynamics? So what happened if we took this action and we moved along? Okay, we would get a reward out of it, right? And we'd also get a state out of it. The reward is something that we can compare, right? We can actually compare this guy against this guy and see how well did that dynamics function do with predicting the reward. We can't directly check the state. We don't know what would be a good state for this, right? So we don't have anything to check against, but we can check the reward. And here's the key. Now we can say, okay, given that we have this new state, it's one step ahead from O42. What are, are our F function here, right? What is our new P that we get out of here? This P that we get out of here is certainly very dependent on this S42 super one. And so we can test how good a job G is doing in coming up with that state. We can kind of go, do a good job of testing how good F is using that state by, again, comparing P142 and Pi43. questions on that. It's a, it's, a, it's a key point here that we are testing not only how well our, um, how well our encoding function does in one step, but also in two steps. And in fact, let's go ahead another step. And we could do even more steps. Okay. So we can do, let's say, five steps. So we can be testing this policy against this policy, this policy against this policy, this one against this one, this one against this one, this one against this one. That will be a test on policies. We can do a check on rewards. This one against this one, this one against this one, and so on. In fact, let's look at the reward loss. What's it going to be? It's going to be, so this is our loss. How do we measure the, the difference between reward losses? And maybe it'll be, uh, you know, a squared error. Who knows? We don't care. There's some function here. So this tests, how good is this against this? And then we test, okay, how good is this against this? And how good is this against this? And finally, how good is this? 
against this. We know how we came up with each of these R sub 42, super one, super two, super three, super fours. We saved the U sub 43, super 44, U sub 45, U sub 46, because that's the words we actually got. And now we can try and say our final loss function is the sum of all those. Okay, so that will be encouraging H and G to do a good job of predicting rewards. Okay. It shouldn't update F at all because F has nothing to do with uh, calculating these rewards. It doesn't end up uh, uh, involved in calculating what R sub 42 super K is. Three separate networks. Okay, three separate networks. But we're going to do gradient descent across the networks. Because the output of one network feeds into the input of another network, you can do gradient descent across those, no problem. Next, we're gonna look at the policies, same idea. We just look at this policy against this policy and keep going with all the policies so that we're now looking at a sum of the loss of all the policies. Okay. Finally, the value. What is the target value? And the idea is we somehow want to be related to the actual rewards we're getting in real life. Okay, so rather than using, we don't use use this as is. Instead, we're going to use n step TD. Okay, we're going to see, say, well, if you want to know what the value of O sub 42 is, well, it should be U43 plus U44 plus U45 plus U46 plus the value of whatever it's worth being in, in, in state 46. And that's where we'll use this. That's our estimate of state 46. So we're, we're tying ourselves more to real life by using instep TD and using these rewards, rather than just directly doing a one step TD and using let's say one reward plus this. So our Z42 and Z is gonna be our target value. Okay, it's still estimated. Ah, I'm so sorry. Uh, so it's still estimated, but, but we're, how we're estimating it is we're just using our standard in-step TD. We're no, we don't have the um, um, Q equals Q plus alpha times whatever. Okay, just like as we're doing in our programming assignment, because of the fact that neural networks already have this learning rate, we just say, what's our target going to be? So our target is our immediate reward plus discounted one-step reward plus twice discounted two-step reward plus n minus one discounted n-step reward plus then our um, discounted estimate of our value down the road. So this plus this plus this plus this plus this discounted appropriately. Does that concept, does anyone have any questions on that concept? Because that's basically it. And if, if, you'll, if you'll stay with me for five or six more minutes, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so what we do then is our target value is we come up with a target for Z42, which is basically in step look ahead. And then for Z43, in step look ahead. Okay, so um, we're gonna fill in basically Z42, Z43, Z44, Z45, Z46. Okay, and then we will compare Z 
against v, z against v, z against v, and so on. Uh, why do we use instapplicate when we could just use the actual rewards? Um, uh, actually, in board games, we're going to. So in board games, we're going to use uh, infant step um, uh, TD. But um, there are a couple of reasons. Um, one is the length of the games is much longer you know, in, in Atari games. And so therefore, we, we go ahead and use the bootstrapping method. And the nice thing also is that it would work in a continuing case, right? So we just uh, value loss, let's see, sorry. The value loss is just the difference between all of these Zs. One thing I want to make clear is there's two different kind of steps that we're using. We're using an unrolling step, which is how many steps are we trying to make sure that the dynamics don't veer off course? Okay. How many steps ahead are we going to make sure that the dynamics are correct? Separate from that, when we're estimating the value, how many steps are we going to look ahead to estimate that? And actually, if I go ahead and look at the, if I look, for instance, at Z46 here, in order to estimate Z46, I've got to actually look at U47 and U48 and U49. Uh, sorry, I can't erase. Oh, so let's just say U49 and so on. And I've got to look at V whatever. So we are actually using more of the saved game in order to do this end step TD. And as Garrett points out, uh, in a board game, we're going to be using infinite step TD, which is basically Monte Carlo. We're going to be using, looking ahead to the end of the game. So we actually have to look farther down the path here. So our loss is going to be just, again, the summation for looking at the Zs as, as different from the Vs. That is how mu0 effectively doesn't have to know the games. So we have these three losses, right? The loss for the reward, the loss for the policy, the loss for the value. And we throw in an extra parameter here, which um, basically um, encourages um, small network weights. Okay, so it's a form of regularization that prevents overfitting. And if you don't do neural networks, just don't even, don't even, even worry about that. Okay. There were some changes in board games versus Atari games. So the board games, we look ahead forever and we don't do any discounting. So basically what that means is Z0 equals Z1 equals, you know, Z42 equals the final game outcome. So we are training the value to be trained against the final board outcome, just as we did in Alpha Zero. But in the Atari games, we're going to use this 10-step uh, TD. So we're going to look at the next 10 rewards and then a, a bootstrap from there. We unroll the five steps, so the unrolling controls how, how far ahead do we check the loss on our um, dynamics. That is, how good does it have to be? And our hope is if we can be correct five steps in the future, uh, then that's enough for our, our Monte Carlo tree search to work. There's a slight discount factor that's used for the Atari games. And the Monte Carlo tree search simulations per move, we use 800 here, and we only use 50 here. Um, and uh, I don't remember the reason for that. 
Uh, I was going to say you have to go to the environment, but you don't go to the environment here. That's the whole point of this. So we're not going to the environment to simulate. So we don't care about that cost. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember. We'd have to look at the paper uh, to, to see why that was. So the result is chess and shogi, we meet the previous uh, champions of alpha. So compared to get orange is alpha zero, alpha zero, alpha zero. And it's really just a matter of how much training do you do uh, until it gets better. So you can, you can beat our current versions that have an explicit model of the world with a learned model. For Atari, we're comparing against um, uh, previous state of the art. State of the art, okay. This one is the uh, mean and this line is the median. Uh, these rewards are in terms of uh, human performance. Okay. So all these are doing much better than human performance. Uh, and all the previous state of the arts for Atari were uh, model free. So apparently having the model helps. In summary, in summary for really the whole class, right? And this is going back to day one. Reinforcement learning consists of an agent. It's interacting with an environment, right? We assume a uh, MDP. It's receiving rewards. And the goal of the agent is learning a policy to maximize the expected long-term discounted reward. That is it for the semester. Are there any questions uh, about anything, including in particular the museum? Well, I had a quick question. Go ahead, Jake. Um, so I was curious, like when we are studying this for the, uh, the final, should we focus more on the um, differences between the different models or like exactly how each of them works? Um, I would say you should know as you're studying for the final what each of the four are, what the major changes between them are, um, and the, you know, the exact formulas that are used, I don't particularly care about, but you should certainly understand, let's say for the Monte Carlo tree search, how the expiration bonus um, is working and how that's related to, let's say, the policy value, um, the distinctions between rollouts and just evaluating the um, value function at the leaf. Uh, but, you know, I, let's say, well, so let me give you an example. Um, well, I can't give you a particular example right now, but definitely know the higher level and I'm not going to be looking at the, um, you know, the particular details. Uh, sorry if this has already been made clear before. Are we allowed a, a note sheet on the final? Let's see, I, I'm trying to remember, I did give you a note sheet on the last midterm, is that right? Yes. So yes, uh, let's say double-sided eight and a half by 11, handwritten. Awesome. Okay. Other questions? So I hope, you know, when you think about the description of reinforcement learning on day one, where we talked about sort of this environment where an agent is wandering around, doesn't really know necessarily what the actions are going to do, what states it'll take it in, and so on, um, and how that closely relates to mu zero, which is the same way. It's taking these actions, 
It doesn't know what states it's going to end up with. It just ends up with these representations of states and a reward and has to figure out what to do this policy to maximize this expected long-term discounted rewards. That all the pieces there make sense now and also a lot of the mechanisms to do it. Okay, the office hours for Thursday and Friday are on the um, schedule. I think it's noon tomorrow and I think it's four on Friday, but you'll have to check. So they'll be in the office hour Zoom channel and I'll be staying on here for another hour. I have enjoyed this very much. Uh, and the next thing will be the final, which is uh, in the schedule, I think comes out on Wednesday. Um, whatever the schedule says is when it'll be available on PDF. Thanks I, so much. I've appreciated having you in class.